This is the Louis T. Network. Hey, either you're outside or you're in the lab room. Welcome, you are in the lab room. Of course, I am your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me. This is the 2015 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series, where I break down all 32 teams in the National Football League's 2015 NFL Draft using our baseball grading scale. Single, double, triple, home runs. There are no strikeouts here in the draft wrap up series as we cannot tell how these players pan out and we cannot tell if these players are going to go in and dominate at the next level much like they did at the college level or if they're going to flame out i don't want to discount any of these athletes before they get their shot at the next level and so there are no strikeouts in this process very simple you want your team to be next simply be the first to leave a comment at the bottom of the video stating two things next in the team you'd like to see next and so it's been a very rough process thus far it's only six teams in and we've already had two uh, people be first in the comment section but not leave the phrase next so again don't be that guy that gets there first but drops the football you run a great route you get open drop the football most important part don't do that Make sure you got both components next and the team you'd like to see next. With all of that out of the way now, okay, let's jump into our next breakdown. And what we do is we get an aggregate score for each team's draft by breaking down each and every single pick, getting a score using that baseball grading scale that I mentioned earlier, averaging up the team's picks, and getting a final score. And then we move on to the next team in the process. So, with that said, we're talking Miami Dolphins, and every year, every single year, the Dolphins are my sleeper pick to, to arrive in the AFC East, and not only just sneak in the back door to postseason, but upstage the New England Patriots. Every year, I look at the AFC East, and I say, who's the team in that division that can make a little noise and, and upstage the Patriots, not the Kings, off of their throne. Who's that team? Every year I pick the same team, the Dolphins. Every year they let me down in some form or fashion. They create ways to let me down. Two years ago, two years ago, they started the season 3-0. We didn't know the Atlanta Falcons were going to be uh, horrible that season. They had a big win at home, come from behind victory, and uh, they started that season out so well. I'm not sure. They may have even beaten the Patriots in week one of that season. I'm, they don't quote me on that, but I tell you what, it started out the year 3-0. They were, they were playing at a relatively high level. And then, of course, in typical Dolphins fashion, the bottom dropped out of that season. But they had a chance to make the postseason, dropped the last two games in ugly fashion. Look, that's behind them now. I really like this draft. To me, of all the teams thus far that I've broken down, and even looking at some drafts from afar without breaking down the tape, looking at a team and their needs, I don't think a team met their needs with quality football players as well as the Dolphins did in this draft. If you look at a team getting players by a need by basis, but also getting the best player available at the same time with some great value, I don't think you'll find a combination of all of that more so than the Dolphins. They had my type of draft, okay? The reason that why they weren't first is because I didn't know what they actually had just looking from afar at their draft. Now that I've had a chance to assess some of the players that they've taken, really like this draft and you'll find out why when I'm done. Let's jump into this breakdown though and start in the first round, 14th overall selection, wide receiver out of Louisville, Devontae Parker. Break it down, Devontae! <laughs> I told the Dolphins, do what you must, do what you will find yourself in a position 
to take this young man out of Louisville. You needed a number one receiver. You needed a horse on the outside, okay? You can talk about all the guys that you got now because the cupboard was big. Before the process started in this offseason, after you traded away all your stuff, released guys, and really just started over. You just said, we're going to start with a blank canvas. We got Jarvis Landry, and we just starting over. And so looking at the team when this process first started out, you had nothing at receiver. You go and you trade for Kenny Stills. You start bringing in other options, and all of a sudden now, you've got plenty of receivers on this football team, and you feel good about where you are. And, but you still need a number one receiver. I love Jarvis Landry. I, I like the fact that you brought in Jordan Cameron. I, I love the fact that you went out and you traded for Kenny Stills. None of those guys are number one options. This kid here out of Louisville is exactly what the doctor ordered. And you just gave Ryan Tannehill a well-deserved brand new contract extension. And so he's a well-paid man. He's the guy in Miami, doesn't have to look over his shoulder anymore. He knows what time it is. You brought back your offensive coordinator, which was very smart because the one thing you don't want to do to a young quarterback is continue to switch offensive coordinators and, and make their head explode. He had some success last year with the offensive coordinator that was already in place. You bring that guy back and Bill Lazor, and now let's just run with it. Let's run with it and see what this kid can do. And I think he's about to take that monumental step that the Dolphins are looking for. And you went out and got him the targets necessary. Devontae Parker. I'm not, I'm not going to break him down again. I've already done that. You want to see that? Go to my breakdown of Devontae Parker when I broke him down in the draft one-on-one -on -one series. But I'll tell you what, this guy is exactly what the AFC East is afraid of. They don't want to see a 6'3", 210, 215-pound receiver carving up their DBs, but that's what's going to happen. This kid is dynamic. The high point the football can do all the things you want him to do. Do all the things you wanted Mike Wallace to do that he didn't do. This kid's going to do it. And then some in the first round, you know what time it is. It's hit hop. It's hit deep. It's hit. Break it down to Vontae. It's a home run for the Miami Dolphins. The first round is they go deep. With Devontae Parker, the guy that I told them they needed to go out and get, and they did it. And look, they didn't even have to give up anything. They stayed at home and got it done. Kudos to the Dolphins for doing exactly that. Not panicking, because I thought my Minnesota was going to give them a run for their money. But at the end of the day, you stuck to your guns, and he fell right in your lap. And you get probably the steal of the first round, because I, I, I thought there was no way he was going to fall at 14. <laughs> So to get him at 14, big coup for the Miami Dolphins. You move on to the second round. Pick number 52, defensive tackle out of Oklahoma, Jordan Phillips. Now, Jordan Phillips for me is another guy that I thought could sneak in the back door of the first round. Thought he had early second round potential. You get him in the middle of the second round late stages of the second round so again another steal for you and your uh, your uh, GM did a magnificent job of wheeling and dealing in this draft traded back with the Philadelphia Eagles Eagles were thirsty for Eric Rowe the cornerback out of Utah so they come up to 47 swap picks with you who you go back to 52 take their pick off their hands and, and with that pick you pick up two more fifth rounders you give up a six so, in, in all actuality, you came out the victor in this trade, and we'll talk about the things that you were able to accomplish by trading back a little bit later on, but big time get for the Dolphins moving back and still getting a player. Maybe they already wanted him all along and, and just were able to move back and still get the guy that they wanted to pair up with Ndamukong Sue in the middle of that defensive line. And so, the way I look at it, you talk about Jordan Phillips, he's going to be your new Paul Solia. Paul Solia was the guy that anchored that rush defense uh, when he was in his prime along with uh, Kendall Langford in the middle of that defense and now you got his in Dominican Sue you put Jordan Phillips next to him he's to me more of a natural nose as a defensive lineman but you play in a 4-3 defense that's your base and so I expect you to put him next to Dominican Sue asking to stop the run on third downs you pull him off the field and you get a package that's more suitable to stopping teams from being able to throw the football on you Get a little bit of pressure on the quarterback. Jordan Phillips not adept at doing that. But again, I'm not breaking this guy down. I already did that in my draft one-on-one -on -one series. So if you're looking for a thorough breakdown of him or Devontae Parker, once again, draft one-on-one -on -one series, check out the video. But I'll tell you what, 
This is a good get for you in the second round. Again, I think it's great value. Now, again, I don't know about the off the field stuff. I, I, I don't know this kid's character. I don't know what his mental makeup is about. I just know what I saw on tape. And what I saw on tape was a really good, well-balanced football player that lacks the ability to get to the quarterback on a consistent basis. But everything else is there. If you're talking stopping the run, talking about getting to the backfield, making some plays that way. You're talking about hustling to the football, giving you everything he's got, plays a high volume number of snaps. But there's a lot of good here with Jordan Phillips. The one thing that I don't like to hear, and I think it's the reason why this guy slips all the way to 52 to you in the second round, because there's first round talent here. The reason why he slips is because people are questioning his desire for the game of football. They're questioning his, his fire. Does this kid actually love the game of football? Is this one of those guys that you pay a couple million dollars to and they don't want to play anymore? The hunger is gone. He's gotten to where he wants to be. He's making the money that he wants to make and now he's satisfied. He really doesn't love the game. Doesn't want to put forth all the effort that's necessary. Is he one of those guys? I don't know the answer to that, but that's what I'm hearing. That's not what I want to hear. That scares me a bit. And because of that, in the second round, 52nd overall selection, uh, a nose tackle out of Oklahoma, Jordan Phillips for me is a triple. Would have been a home run. This is a great deal. First of all, Dolphins moved back five picks. Still get great value on a guy that I thought was a late first rounder, early second rounder in Jordan Phillips. And then you acquire more depth later on in the draft by acquiring two more fifth round selections. So to me, this was a huge deal that you were able to engage in with the Eagles, get you some picks, get you some value, and still get a great football player. I question now, does this guy love football? We will find out together. You can only go off of what people tell you. None of us have been there and know how this kid thinks. And he's going to say all the right things, say what he's supposed to say. We'll see what happens when he gets on the field. But I, what I saw on tape, I like. Now it's just about him going out and doing it at the next level on a consistent basis. It's a triple for the Dolphins in the second round. Defensive tackle out of Oklahoma, Jordan Phillips. We go to the fourth round, no third round selection via the trade with the Saints to acquire Kenny Stills. So no third round selection for the Dolphins. We go to the fourth round, 114th overall selection, guard out of Arizona State, Jameel Douglas. Jump into his game. He's a 6'4", 304 pound offensive lineman, okay? And so the first pro that I really looked at was he was able to hold his water in pass protection. Translation, he's able to anchor down and not give a lot of ground when being bull rushed. Now there were a couple of times he got off balance, guys were able to pick him up, dump truck him into the lap of the quarterback. Doesn't happen often though. He's a guy that usually is able to hold his weight and not give ground in the pass pro. Plays with physicality, and again, when you're an offensive lineman, that to me is prerequisite. You gotta play with physicality. If you're soft as an offensive lineman, you don't stand a chance in the trenches. And we know that's where the battle is won in the National Football League. We can talk about the prima donnas, we can talk about all the skilled guys and how pretty they look running around out there, at wide receiver, running back, quarterback. They get all the accolades, they get all the recognition, but the game is won and lost in the trenches. And if you don't play with physicality, if the guy across from you is more physical than you are, he's going to win nine times out of 10. And that's where the game is won in the National Football League. And he plays with the physicality that you need to get it done at the NFL level. Has a solid punch and that kind of speaks to the physicality that I talked about. He's a guy that tries to stop your initial rush with that first punch, that initial punch to get you off balance, stop your momentum, and really give him a chance to anchor down and get the job done, snap in and snap out. Shows the ability to be mobile. Here's a guy that played at tackle in 2014. In 2013, you saw a little bit more of what he'll be asked to do at the next level as a guard, he played guard in 2013, 2014. He was probably their best offensive lineman a lot of times in college football. Whether you're a tackle or not, if you're the best offensive lineman we've got, teams generally stick you at left tackle just because, hey look, you're the best we've got, okay? We need you protecting the blind side of the quarterback. So even if it's not your best position, but you're the best that we've got, we might need to kick you outside. Now, if we've got another option and we feel good about it, we'll leave you where you are. But if we don't have an option that we trust, we're gonna ask you to make a sacrifice to the team, play left tackle. Well, I think he had to do that. He was their best option at left tackle. They put him out there. He was solid, wasn't great. And to me, he's a better guard than he is a tackle. 
And I'll talk about why he's a better guard than a tackle and why he will play guard at the next level versus tackle. But I told you, his ability to be mobile stems from him playing tackle. They would pull him at Arizona State. When I say pull him, I'm not talking about a gap or two gaps. They would pull him all the way from his left tackle position. And he would come around and go all the way to the outside of the right tackle. And that would be his block to seal off the edge on that side as a pulling tackle. So you gotta be a mobile guy to get all the way from your position as the left tackle and come all the way to the outside where the tight end would line up on most running plays. So that's a big time transition and he was able to do that seamlessly at Arizona State to get outside and be that kick out block when he pulls around. Versatility, I just told you basically why he's a versatile guy. Played left tackle at Arizona State. He's more naturally a guard, played left guard in 2013, played tackle in 2014. So you get versatility there. Really don't think the Dolphins are looking for that versatility to be able to play tackle. I think they want him to be a guard, whether it's left or right, it really doesn't matter. I think they are looking at him as a guard prospect at the next level and in a pinch if need be maybe this is a guy that can also kick inside to center as well but again I think they're looking at him strictly as a guard at the next level for the Miami Dolphins but he does provide versatility at tackle if necessary you go to his cons athletically challenged laterally and that's the thing that scares me with him this is why I said he's a better fit as a uh, guard than a tackle because you can see him getting beat to the outside because he doesn't have the lateral quickness to, to stay with the guys with elite athleticism that have quickness off the snap. He just was outmatched uh, a number of times and he would get beat off the snap. And the next con is he doesn't recover well. So if he gets beaten initially off the snap, he's not a guy that I feel comfortable with recovering and finding a way to still win the war. Even though he lost the battle early on, it's one thing to lose the battle, it's another thing to lose the war. You can lose the battle early on, God beat you off the snap initially, but if you're a great offensive lineman, you find a way to win the war by pushing him around and getting back into play and allowing your quarterback to have somewhere to step up and deliver the football. He didn't do that well enough for me. If you beat him off the snap, you beat him. He's not quick enough to recover, and I saw that a number of times on the tape, which, why, which is why I feel like it's natural for him to kick inside if he gets beat to the inside or if he gets beat with a little bit of quickness and a lot of times you won't find elite quickness inside but in the case that you do you got help to your left you got help to your right whether the tackle can give him a little nudge or the center can help you out you've always got someone to lean on and so quickness usually isn't that big of a deal inside as much as it is when you're on an island as a tackle Lacks the preferred size to be a tackle. I just talked about that. Don't think the Dolphins are really entertaining the thought of this guy being a tackle. Anyway, at 6'4", 304 pounds, you're not tall. It's crazy to even say that. I remember a time where 6'4", 304 pounds was mammoth in the National Football League. Back in the mid-90s when the Cowboys were dominating, where they, they were really the, one of the first teams to introduce these huge offensive linemen and really start the trend of having huge guys up front that great wall of Dallas and that, that offensive line with those guys was really the, the start of these huge offensive linemen and the change with the Larry Allens and the Mark Tuanes of the world. Those guys were mammoth and they would get the job done. And so now you start to see it. it's amazing. Now 6'4", 304 pounds is not big enough to play tackle at the National Football League level, especially left tackle. You might be able to get away with that at right tackle, but you can't have that at left tackle now, especially with the arm length and all of those things. Guys are just so good at getting to the quarterback now that you gotta have the arm length and they'd like you to be a little bit taller and all of those things. It's just amazing that 6'4 isn't big enough, but that's the fact that it is now. It just is what it is, and he's just not big enough to play tackle. But look, look he's a solid football player. There, there are some things he's going to have to work on. Again, that, that lateral quickness scares me, or lack thereof. It scares me to death. And so we'll see what happens and see if him being a guard, I thought he played much better as a guard in 2013 when I watched the tape there. I, it, the, the tape was a lot cleaner as at guard than it was at tackle, which is what the Dolphins are looking at him as. So uh, that does give me a little bit of comfort knowing that he's not going to be asked to play tackle at the next level. But still a little nervous because you don't see as many dynamic defensive tackles at the collegiate level, you come to the NFL, you're going to run into some guys that can get it done. And the, the Patriots have a couple of freaky defensive tackles 
And, and if Dominic easily is healthy, he could be one of those guys that could present a problem for him. We know about Marcel Darius and what kind of an athlete he is. Just in that division alone, he could struggle if he's not on his uh, A game. And so we'll see what happens for me. He's a double in the fourth round, solid pick. And, and this offensive line is coming together. If you get your, your big prized free agent of last year to come back healthy and Brandon Albert from the ACL tear, I think you'll be in great shape along that offensive line. And, and so it's starting to all kind of fit together. I think he might be the missing piece at guard for you, but he needs to come in, get to work, work on those deficiencies, clean them up, and start to bring some continuity to this Dolphins offensive line. If he can do that, that double could turn easily into a triple or a home run down the road. For me right now, he is a double in the fourth round. You move on to the fifth round. 145th overall selection out of Memphis, a cornerback by the name of Bobby McCain. This pick is from the Eagles. I talked about the Eagles and the Dolphins making that swap in the second round. This is one of the picks they were able to recoup from the Philadelphia Eagles. And so let's talk about Bobby McCain and his pros. You start with his agility, very agile. At 5'9", about a buck 95 or so, this is a guy that is extremely agile, light on his feet, makes very quick and, and sudden movements, and it allows him to get to the football and make plays on it and be around when the football is being delivered. Love his agility right off the bat. First thing that jumped off the screen at me was his agility and his movement skills. Feisty competitive quarterback. That's the next pro. This is a guy, I just told you he's 5'9", he's not a big guy, but he competes like the Dickens. This guy's gonna be around the football. And I don't care, it's funny. I watched a couple of tapes on this guy, and, and of the three, four, maybe five tapes I watched on I think I watched about four, somewhere in there, four or five. Of the tapes that I watched, you had a BYU game in there, you had a an old miss game too. And you're talking about some of these big time bigger receivers that he was up against. You're talking about Laquan Treadwell, a guy that is about 6'3, 6'4. Um, and, and he might be one of those guys that's like a long 6'2, but I'm, he looks more like a 6'3, 6'4 guy. And, and out of Ole Miss, he's stud receiver. You'll hear his name coming up here shortly in a little bit uh, down the road. And then you got against BYU, a guy named Mitch Matthews. This is a 6'6 receiver we're talking about here. And he was competing against these guys. He didn't care how big these guys were. And I'm talking, we're talking about a 5'9 corner going up against 6'3, six, 6'6 six, six receivers. And he's right there. He doesn't care. He's like a little pesky net in these guys' ears. And he doesn't care. He's competing. He's going after the football. He's tackling these guys. He could care less about the difference in size. And so love his ab ability and, and willingness to compete. He gets nasty and dirty in the run game. Will come in, make a tackle. Like I said, guy is feisty. He is a competitor. Love that about Bobby McCain. Understands zone concepts. What they asked him to do a lot of times at Memphis was to play an area. They didn't necessarily ask him to play in a lot of man-to-man -man coverage, although I did see that on tape, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But they asked him to play in zone coverage, play out of space, read the eyes of the quarterback, see if you can't jump something, see if you can't make a play. He understands zone concepts and what the offense is trying to do, and he's very nosy, and if you make a mistake, if you don't see him lurking in the shadows, he'll make you pay. And he did that against Ole Miss. Bo Wallace in the pocket, looking at a deep crosser down the field. He's in zone coverage. Looks like some kind of cover three that he's in as one of the deeper thirds. His receiver that he was guarding on the outside runs a post, which carries out to the middle of the field, which allowed Bobby McCain to pass him off to the safety who has the middle third of the field. So in doing so, Bobby McCain realizes, here comes another receiver trying to come into my zone. And the quarterback doesn't expect me to stay there because of that deep post. He expects me to carry that out. So I'm going to sag off of this post, come underneath on that crosser that's coming into my zone, and jump this route and pick it off. Bo Wallace never saw him, jumps in front of the route, picks it off. Heady play, understands zone co concepts. And he's a dangerous guy when in zone coverage because he's looking at the eyes of the quarterback and looking to make a read and get a bead 
on the football. Locates the ball when it's in the air. When he's in man-to-man -man coverage, when he's in zone coverage, it really doesn't matter. He, he knows where the football is, and he's looking for the football. Another big time pro for me. You know I love it when corners locate the football. Again, you can't catch, you can't make a play on what you can't see. He locates the football and therefore is able to make a play on it. Great ball skills. So when you kind of couple all these things together, great ball skills, locates the football, understands zone concept, you put all those things together, you get the next pro. 12 in his collegiate career and a four year career. So you're talking about three interceptions per year, which is excellent. Four of those, this is the biggest part. Yeah, this is the biggest part of this though. Four of these turned out to be to the crit house calls for Bobby McCain. So you're talking about a guy that not only gets his hands on the football, but when he does, he's looking to take it the other way for six and make you pay in the biggest way possible. So that's big time for me, a lot of production at Memphis. You move on to him being a, a capable blitzer. And this is a guy, and I'm gonna go ahead and lump, lump these last two pros in. Capable blitzer because he plays in the slot, but he also plays outside. I told you, he was playing amongst the trees outside. He was playing with some giants. Now, don't know if he's gonna be able to get away with that at the next level or not. And, and I'm gonna talk about why I love this pick for the Dolphins a little bit later on. But he, he was playing amongst the trees on the outside. So you're talking about those 6'3", 6'4", 6'6", guys he was going up against and matching up with and battling against. But then he also slides into the slot, which is probably where he's going to play more likely at the next level. And he's able to come off that slot and blitz. There was one play, he knew he wasn't going to get to the quarterback. He knew there was not a chance he was going to get there. Quarterback had already diagnosed blitz, read it, was going to get rid of the football. So he reads the quarterback's eyes, sees the quarterback trying to deliver the football, gets his hands up, jumps in the air, deflects the football. Not only is he a capable blitzer and a guy that can get to the quarterback because of his quickness, but he's also a guy that knows if I can't get there, get my hands up, try to make something happen. So capable blitzer and the versatility. He can play the slide, he can play out wide, he can do a number of things. Really like Bobby McCain and his ability to do a lot of things on the football field. You go to his cons, he gives up sides. There's no doubt about it. There's nothing he can do about this. This is something he cannot control. He's 5'9", he's not going to grow another inch in his life. He's a 5'9 cornerback and that's what you're getting. And so because he's 5'9", I told you he battled and went up against these 6'6", six, 6'4", six, six, receivers, they still have a huge size advantage. And the, the Mitch uh, Matthews kid from BYU caught a touchdown pass on him. This had nothing to do with size, but he was able to beat him deep and get in the end zone, catch a touchdown. It's just nothing you can do when you're 5'9", and a guy across from you is 6'5". There's just a big disparity in height. He's going to give up size, and I think that goes with the next con to me. Overmatched often in the run game, and really it's just his size. I mean, what can you do when the guy in front of you is 6'3", 225, and you're 5'9", 195? You're giving up 30 pounds, you're giving up arm length and all of that, good reach. I mean, if that receiver comes up, puts his arms on you before you can put your arms on him, what are you gonna do? Then he, he redirects you, he's got 30 pounds on you, what are you gonna do? I mean, he's often overmatched in the run game because of his size. And again, a lot of that will be helped when he kicks inside to the slot. A lot of times you don't have big, massive slot receivers. You only have the smaller, shifty guys, which is right down his alley. He'll be able to really compete against those guys a little bit better in the run game. Doesn't possess elite speed. He's a 4-5-1, 40 guy. Now again, 4-5-1 isn't slow, it just isn't fast. It's not blazing fast. It's fast enough to compete at the next level. And I told you, I love his agility, so that's gonna help him in the slot. But it's not blazing fast to keep up with guys. And you saw it on one play against BYU, that same touchdown I talked about against Mitch Matthews. He beats him deep, he gets him, uh, gets leverage on him, gets on top of him, stacks him on his hip. And then uh, Bobby McCain trips over his own feet, falls down, guys wide open for a like 45 yard touchdown. He was beaten on the play anyway. I don't think he would have been able to recover. And that, that's where the lack of makeup speed comes into play. You get beaten initially off the line of scrimmage, you lose the battle early on, and you can't win the war because you don't have enough speed to make up for being beat initially off the line of scrimmage. But I'll tell you what, man, the production, the tape, it's clean. His ball awareness, his ability to compete when the football is in the air, 
I love a lot of, of what I saw out of Bobby McCain. And the thing that I love the most, however, is the fact that he's going to a team with another feisty 5'8", five, 5'9", five, corner <clears throat> that you have on your team that probably is one of the best small corners in the entire National Football League. And so you bring him onto your team with a guy like Brent Grimes, he's only going to learn how to play this game that much better by learning from a guy like Brent Grimes. I love this pick because of the fact that you have a corner of the same stature that plays on the outside, that gets it done at an elite level against guys that are way bigger than him, and he doesn't shy away from the competition. He has that kind of fight in him, does Bobby McCain, and if he can get in the hip pocket of a Brent Grimes, this kid's gonna be awesome. I love him in the fifth round. I think you got great value here. For me, he is a triple into the corner, bounce around, right fielder couldn't get it back in time, a little bit of speed, slides in head first, third base safe. Triple in the fifth round for the Dolphins with the quarterback out of Memphis, Bobby McCain. We move on to the next fifth round selection. This is my best and most ecstatic pick of this draft for the Dolphins. Fifth round, 149th overall selection, running back out of Boise State. Let's take a ride on the J train. It's Jay Ajayi. This is my man. Now, I told you that in the draft a 101 prospects series that I love this kid. I told you he was one of my favorite backs in this draft. And I'm not going to break him down. You know I'm not going to break him down because I've already done that. But I'm going to say this and then we're going to skedaddle and move on to the next pick. This is a guy that I feel like gives you the one-two punch you were looking for. This is what you were looking for when you drafted Lamar Miller, you had Daniel Thomas, you were hoping to have a power and a speed one-two punch. You're going to have that now. Lamar Miller came into his own last year, okay? A lot of people say, why are you drafting a running back? You got Lamar Miller. Lamar Miller is nice, but you're looking for a guy to be a change of pace. Jay Ajayi is going to be that guy for you. This dude is a stud. And I know the injury concerns. I think people had some medical issues with him with the knee and all of that stuff. Look, I don't know anything about that, okay? All I know is what I saw on tape and what I think this guy could be at the next level. I don't know what the, the concerns are, you know, medically and what teams saw and if doctors had an issue with his knee or whatever. Look, all I know is you got to steal in the fifth round now. If this guy stays healthy, Teams are going to regret passing on him round after round after round. Somebody could have took a flyer out on this guy a lot sooner. I mean, for him to fall in your lap in the fifth round is criminal. You know what this is. You know what this is. In the fifth round, 149th overall selection, running back out of Boise State, Jay Ajayi. You can put it on the bus. Yes! It's a home run. You know what time it is. And I don't give out fifth round home runs very often, so you know I'm in love with this pick. Dolphins got themselves a ball player, folks. This young man here, AFC East is in trouble. I'm gonna tell you right now, between Lamar Miller turning on the Jets, and I'm telling you, the light bulb came on for Lamar last year. You add Jay Ajayi to the mix. You got all the targets outside now, and we about to talk about another wide receiver target in a little bit to wrap up your draft. You got a lot of weapons offensively, man. I'm excited. If we can protect Ryan Tannehill up front, give this man some time, open up some lanes for these running backs, the Dolphins are going to be a scary team, folks. Listen to what I'm saying. They're putting together a quality football team. Now, it's all about execution on the field. But right now on paper, scary bunch. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. Don't kill me. I'm just a messenger. I'm just telling you, looks real nasty down there in South Beach. Move on to another fifth round selection, the third for the Dolphins. Very next pick, 150th overall, safety out of Minnesota, Cedric Thompson, another pick from Philadelphia, the gift that keeps on giving Dolphins. I'm telling you, Dennis Hickey, he, he outdid himself here. He came into this all season, was he on the hot seat? This is a hell of a trade. I'm going to tell you right now, and you're going to reap the benefits of this trade down the road. Dennis Hickey did you guys a huge solid with this trade. He did a big time solid for you because y'all got some really good football players out of this draft because of the trade he made with the Eagles sliding back five picks and picking up some really good valuable assets later on in the draft. And here's one of them. Let's talk about Cedric Thompson. Six foot, 208 pound 
safety. I love that kind of size. You want your safeties to fill out. And in this day and age where safeties are getting smaller and smaller, and we act safeties to not only be a strong safety, but to be a free safety too. You gotta be interchangeable. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on. Matter of fact, that's the next pro, so let's just go ahead and get into it right now. He's interchangeable. He's got a cornerback body, but he's got a safety mentality and he plays like a safety. So that's a good thing because what that allows him to do is it allows him to come down, be a hammer in a box as an eighth defender if necessary, but also allows him to run around, cover over the slot, run with a tight end, run with a uh, third wide receiver. It allows him to be flexible, which is what this league has moved to. You gotta have corners or excuse me, safeties that are interchangeable. Your safety has to be able to run like a cornerback and hit like a safety, hit like a linebacker. And so this guy, don't know if he hits necessarily like a linebacker, but he gets guys on the ground, which takes us to our next pro. He's a very good tackler. You wanna see a guy make a lot of great tackles, some touchdown saving tackles. Yeah, he missed some tackles in that Wisconsin game. He missed some tackles in that game, but I tell you what, he made more touchdown saving tackles in that game. A lot of open field tackles too, where you're like, man, if you miss this tackle, this play is going for a lot of yardage. And there was a lot of out in space tackles. He closes the gap on guys quickly, so if there's a lot of space between he and the ball carrier, he's trying to get to the outside. Space is closed very quickly, and he's a very short tackler, gets guys on the ground. We all know Melvin Gordon, the third, not an easy guy to get down on the ground, or excuse me, the second. Not an easy guy to get down on the ground. And Cedric Thompson Jr. does that. Gets guys on the ground. Very good tackler, very impressed with his ability to get guys on the ground. Nice form tackles too. Not none of these shoulders coming in recklessly. He's coming in, wrapping guys up. Even when he missed one of those tackles against Wisconsin, it was a, a tackle where he's like, that's a hell of a play by Melvin Gordon. To get out of that, that's a four tackle. He brought the tackle and, and was able to pick up some more yardage. That's a great play by Melvin Gordon. Wasn't a bad uh, you know, display of tackling and uh, poor tackling by Cedric Thompson as much as it was just a great individual effort by Melvin Gordon to keep his balance, stay on his feet, and get more yards after contact. You know, you saw him doing some big things in the Purdue game, speaking of which, can make plays on the football. He gets an interception against Purdue. Game saving, I'm talking about Purdue. This is a shootout. We're talking score might be 45, you know, 42. Late in the ball game, Purdue has the football. They're, they have they have a chance, does Purdue, to, to go down and either get the game time field goal or win the game. And Cedric Thompson Jr. is in coverage against the tight end who's coming across the field. It's a bad throw now, okay? But he still had to make the play. He not only catches the football, but he dives, leaves his feet. You know, that makes it even more impressive to have to leave your feet, dive, go in front of the tight end, take the football away from him. Give me that. That's my snatches. You don't want it. I do. Game over. To get up, make that kind of play. That's big time. He can make plays. He had two interceptions in that game. One almost to the crib. Very first play of the game, matter of fact. An interception down to about the three-yard line leads to a touchdown. In the last play of the game defensively, to seal it, interception, to seal the game up against Purdue. So big time football, how this kid can make plays on the football. So I've just told you, really good tackler, make plays on the football, there's a lot to like here. Let's go to his cons. He needs to look for the football when he's down the field though. You know, I watched another game against uh, Wisconsin, he's running down the field, another game against Ohio State, running down the field with a tight end, doesn't look for the football. Now it was overthrown both times, so he got away with it. But you gotta find football. He didn't even know, it's almost like he didn't know the football was in the air. Don't rely on the receiver to tell you when the ball is coming. Locate football. You need to know where the man is. You gotta feel for him. He's right here. He's right in front of you. You can put your arm on him and feel where he is. Find the football. He never looked. I, that's a problem at the next level because guys are really adept at the next level of not tipping when the football's coming. They're not gonna tell you to the last second. Guy will run, football's coming. They're still running. They're not going to put their hands up. Now the football's here. Boom. Catch. He's got to look for the football located in the air. Make sure you know where it's at so you don't pick up a pass in the fast penalty. Can be over aggressive in the Purdue game. <laughs> he got sucked up on play action fake one time. It was a thing of beauty for the offense. Boy, did it look bad for Cedric Thompson Jr. Okay, so it's classic fake 31 situation. He's expecting run. 
they come, beautiful plash effect, suck him up. He takes about three false steps up. Um, 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 uh oh, spaghetti oh, tight end out the back door. Guess who they saw? Tight end in the end zone, easy money, touchdown. Can't happen. Cannot happen. Not when you're 25 yards away from the end zone. Okay. If it's third and one from the two yard line, you want to sell out? Okay. It happens. Not third and one from the 25 yard line. You can't fall asleep like that. Easy money, touchdown. So he can be over aggressive sometimes. Another play in that same Purdue game. Told you it was a shootout. He's supposed to be going in motion with a, a receiver that's in the backfield. They send him in, in motion to do, their, do Purdue. And, and the receiver comes across the formation. He's following him. For some reason, he runs into a guy as he's trying to follow him in motion. They throw the football to that same receiver that came in motion across the formation. And instead of him going out there and trying to make, he tries to take a direct angle. That receiver smoked the whole entire Minnesota defense. Scores about a 60 yard touchdown. If he would've took a better angle, probably doesn't score a touchdown, but it's his man. He makes a mistake. Worse, compounding that mistake by taking a poor angle, he gets in the end zone. So, need him to not be over aggressive and make the smart play. And so, that takes me to my last, <laughs> my last con. And it's almost like I'm contradicting myself here because I said don't be over aggressive. He needs to find that middle ground though because now I'm asking him, don't be a robot. Don't be a robot. Don't be a robot, dude. Don't be mechanical. There are several examples of this guy ignoring what's going on on the field because he has a job to do. You gotta be a football player. You can't say, okay, I got the flaps. So despite the play going right past me toward the middle of the field, I, I'm not, I can't worry about that. Even though it's a run and I'm thinking it's a pass and my responsibility is the flaps. And even though I, I, it's a run, I still gotta get out here to the flaps. No, be a football player. If it's a run and you got the flaps, because you think it's a pass, and now you see it's a run and it's going up the middle, go and attack the football. Why are you still running out to the flats and opening up a gaping hole up the middle of the field? He, done, he did that a number of times. Well, I'm like, dude, they're running, they're running read option in the backfield and you're sprinting to the flats. You don't even know what the hell's going on. Back turn to the action, they run right by him. Like, literally, he could have reached out and touched the guy with the ball. He had no clue they were right there because he's not paying attention. He's being a robot. I got a job to do, I'm gonna go do my job. No, don't go out there. It's not even a pass, okay? That was because you thought it was a pass. It's a run. Know what's going on, don't be a robot. Don't be mechanical. Don't feel like I got a job to do. Let me just go do my job and forget about everything else that's happening on the field. You gotta be able to adjust on the fly. Don't be a robot. Don't be mechanical. You're a human. You can make adjustments. Do it. So he needs to find that happy medium. Don't be over aggressive. Don't be a robot. I need you to be somewhere in between. But I'll tell you what, it's a lot to like here. In the fifth round, 150th overall selection, safety out of Minnesota. It's a triple for me. I really like this kid. I, I told you, he tackles well. He makes plays on the football. He's interchangeable. And to me, that's the biggest thing, is that he gives you that safety that you're looking for in the box as a guy that can get players on the, on the ground. But he also can play 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 yards away from the uh, line of scrimmage and run with guys. Got adequate speed. I think he's a great athlete. And that's something that gets lost in the sauce at 208 pounds, six foot. He's got cornerback skills. He's got a cornerback body, but it's still a safety and has a safety mentality. So like a lot of what he brings to the table, he's a triple, man. I like this kid a lot. I think he's going to help the Dolphins down the road. And finally, in the fifth round, the fourth, fifth round selection. This is why I love this Dolphin, Dolphins draft because you know how I am. I like to get the players and get out. I don't want 10 players. I don't want a 10 player draft, especially when you got three seventh rounders. I, I miss me with that draft. Give me the clean, efficient, seven pick draft where you get four, count them, four fifth round picks. There's no seventh and sixth round guys that probably won't make your round. We got fifth, fifth rounders are supposed to make your team, folks. And I think every single one of these guys, every single one of them, is gonna make this Dolphins roster. Somehow, some way, they're gonna make this roster. These are good football players. Let's talk about the last pick. Fifth round, 156th overall selection. Cornerback slash wide receiver out of Michigan State, Tony Lippett. His pros, 6'2", 192 pounds, so he's got a bigger frame receiver here. Makes tough catches 
in traffic, uh, and that, that kind of speaks to that 6-2 frame, allowing him to go up, be tough in traffic, come down with the football, very strong hands, like the fact that he's able to go in traffic and get it done uh, with bodies around him, and it takes us to our next pro, uses his frame well to high point the football, there's a couple of plays where you watch him, goes up, takes the football off the helmet of a defender, and is able to catch the football despite the defender being draped all over him. He uses his frame well, boxes guys out on slant routes and post routes to get that position, to give his quarterback an inviting target. And this takes us to our next uh, pro, great route running ability. And I'm gonna tell you why this is so important for a guy like Tony Lippett a little bit later on. But right now, his route running ability is excellent. He sets his routes up great. He stems them at the top of the route. And a lot of times you don't know if it's a deep route, if he's coming back to the football, is it an in-breaking route. You really can't tell, he doesn't tip it off. They all look the same, which to me, as a receiver is the key. You want all your routes to look exactly the same. The nine routes should look exactly like the eight, and all of them should look exactly the same. That, that fly should look exactly like that comeback. That comeback should look exactly like that post. They should all mirror each other. They shouldn't be able to tell what you're doing coming off the line of scrimmage till it's too late. And you've already won, and a lot of times that's what happens with Tony Lippin. He's got a he's got a lot of versatility, and this isn't your normal average run of the mill versatility. I'm not talking about a guy that can play out wide and in the slot, which is what he did at Michigan State. He played out wide. He was their best receiver, the the Big Ten uh, wide receiver of the conference. So he won the wide receiver of the year in the conference. So you know he was doing big things: 12 touchdowns, over 1,100 yards receiving. So set records for the Michigan State uh, Spartans and it was big time for them. He was the man for them in that offense. And he played in the slot and he played out wide. But I'm talking about the fact that he's Bill Belichick versatile. I mean, and I know Dolphin fans don't even want to hear that name. I understand, I get it. But this is the type of player that Bill Belichick would have selected. A guy that can play cornerback and wide receiver. He started against Penn State in uh, that game as a wide receiver and as a corner. I actually went and watched that game because I wanted to see what he looked like as a corner. I thought he handled himself well. Now, Penn State isn't a good team to watch, though, because Penn State, very sluggish offense. They don't have a lot of high-caliber athletes at the wide receiver position. He was running step-to-step -step with these guys. And I'm going to tell you why that's an anomaly, because he shouldn't be running step-to-step -step with these guys, but he was. He was in the hip pocket of these receivers. The coverage looked damn good. I mean, there wasn't a, a play where he was beat. He was around the football, almost had an interception on one of them. I don't think he could do that on a consistent basis, but it's always good to know that's in your back pocket. If need be, this guy could be an emergency corner for you on your football team. Go to his cons. Lacks top end speed. That's why the route running ability is so important because that's how he's going to create a separation. Not with speed, not with quickness, but with great route running ability. And that's why it was so impressive to watch him run step for step with those Penn State receivers at cornerback because he doesn't have top end speed. He's a 4'6", 140 guy. To me, he's a bigger version of Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry is 5'11", six feet maybe stretching it. He's a 5'11 guy, 205 pounds or so, but just a, a, a hell of a route runner and just physically imposing and gets to the football. Tony Lippett, to me, not as physical as a Jarvis Landry, but just as polished a receiver as Jarvis Landry is. He can get open, make tough catches in traffic, just a bigger version of him. I question his ability at the next level to separate from sticky man-to-man -man coverage. Uh, Ohio State did something that I thought was interesting. What they did was they took their best corner, Duran Grant, and, and told him, hey, that's your man all night. You're gonna follow him around. If he's on the field, that's where you're going to be. And he was in his face, he was coming up, challenging him. What's up, man? I'm gonna be here all day, what's good with you? I'm like nothing, man, just over here setting records in the Big Ten, all right, cool, I'm gonna be checking you all night, so I hope you're ready. And I don't know if Tony Lippett was, but it just was not a good night for Tony Lippett. He didn't find ways to separate from Duran Grant. He was in his hip pocket all night. Tony Lippett probably had his worst game of the season against Ohio State in that blowout loss at home, so, uh, that's what, what scares me. Durant Grant was drafted into the league in this year's NFL draft. So uh, you're going to see guys like that every week now. You know, it's okay to beat up on the Iowa corner. It's okay to beat up on the Minnesota corner. It's okay to beat up on all those corners 
in you know the, the Big Ten, but when you see elite level corners, can he separate from that quality of athleticism in man-to-man -man tight coverage? I don't know if he can. That's where that catching in traffic and that route running ability is going to have to step up for a guy like Tony Lippett. He's going to have to put on a little bit of weight too. Not as physical in the run game, and I think this speaks more to that 192 pound frame than anything else. Because he's 6'2", he should be able to be more physical in the run game, but he's not. Because he's a, he's a young boy, he's a little boy. 192, you got corners out here that's 200 pounds that's throwing this guy out of the way. You got 185 pound corners throwing this guy out of the way, being more physical than him in the run game. So that's something else he's going to have to work on, be a little bit more physical in the run game. I think he's got a frame that I think can stand to gain 8 to 10 pounds and get up to that 200 pound threshold and then be a little bit more physical off the line of scrimmage and, and being able to disengage from guys. And I think the Dolphins will work with him to put on a little bit more weight and be even more imposing physically as a receiver. But when it's all said and done, that versatility and the things that he brings to the table, for me, it's another solid double in the fifth round. The fourth, uh, fifth round selection for the Dolphins is a double. Tony Lippett, to me, going to come in and be like a fourth option in, in his offense as a receiver. I mean, that's amazing that you can get that kind of quality. This is a good football player. I just told you, the best receiver in the Big Ten last year, as voted on by the coaches and everybody involved. This guy was outstanding for Michigan State. Connor Cook looked for this guy on a consistent basis, and eight times out of ten, Mr. Lippitt got it done. So we're talking about a big-time football player that you're getting in the fifth round with that kind of production going to come in and help this wide receiving core that went from empty to full in a hurry. You got two quality receivers in this draft. You got two quality receivers already on the roster. You add a tight end like Jordan Cameron. If he's healthy, come on, man. What are we doing here in Miami? I'm telling you, it's scary. It's scary even uh, what the Dolphins are putting together. Defensively, offensively, sky's the limit for this team. It's all about health, continuity, and playing consistent football, something the Dolphins haven't been able to do over the last five seasons. Let's see what they do after this excellent draft they put together. Let's, let's tally up these points, shall we? Couple of home runs in Parker and Jay Ajayi. You got three triples in Jordan Phillips, also cornerback Bobby McCain out of Memphis, and then the safety out of Minnesota, Cedric Thompson. You get a triples bonus because of three triples, so we add another three in there. Two doubles in the form of your fourth round pick, offensive guard out of Arizona State, Jamil Douglas and your last pick in the draft, wide receiver out of Michigan State, Tony Lippett. You add all of that up, you get 24 points for the Dolphins, seven picks by these Dolphins, slice it up, and you get a 3.4 triple, good enough for a tie, a first place tie with the New Orleans Saints in the NFL draft wrap-up series. So they got a triple, they rounded third base, thought about going home, realized, that center fielder's got a gun. I probably should go back to third base and remain safe. It's cool. It's a 3.4 triple. And again, tied for first in the 2015 NFL Draft wrap-up series with the New Orleans Saints. That's going to do it for the Dolphins in their 2015 NFL Draft wrap-up. If it happens in the National Football League, whether big or small, we cover it all here in the lab room. Come back and join me as I continue to break down anything and everything in the National Football League season. Next time on the program. There's plenty more where that came from. While you're here, subscribe to the channel. If you want more Louis T, be sure to follow me on Twitter at In The Lab Room or you can like the Facebook page at In The Lab Room. That's In The Lab Room on Facebook and at in the lab room on twitter don't forget subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so